Who wants to be a slave to the law of Moses? Not me. Hi, I'm David Servant, and this is Heavenward TV. Well, it's so good to be together again as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And here we are in Galatians chapter 4, beginning today a new paragraph, verse number 21. And so if you've got your Bible, you might want to take a look there and read along with me. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. You who have been viewing know what the problem was in Galatia, and you know what Paul was doing to fix it. Gentiles are under no obligation to keep the law of Moses. In fact, ever since Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, and the uh, curtain in the temple was ripped in half, uh, no Jew has been under any obligation to keep the law of Moses either. However, there's still the law of conscience, there's still the law of Christ. We've talked about that. So, Paul now addresses his readers in verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, do you not listen to the law? And so again, clearly, the law of Moses is what's under discussion here, not the law of Christ. And he's going to refer to something that uh, is an Old Testament story with which uh, maybe by that time even the Gentiles there in Galatia would be familiar with. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. Well, you know that story, I'm sure. Um, Abraham was married to a gal named Sarah. She was not able to bear children. And uh, it was, you know, that's always uh, tough on anybody, any couple that can't have kids. Um, but thankfully, there's always the option of adoption for, for many of those folks. But back in that day, not having an heir, not having a son, seemed like it was a, a, a much deeper problem in people's minds culturally and so forth. And so, you know, Sarah and Abraham were really disturbed that. Well, Abraham got a promise from God. Now, th through your own descendant, I'm going to bring all this blessing and so forth. And, and it didn't work out as fat quickly as Abraham had wanted. And so he and Sarah took things into their own hands. Uh, this is called working it out yourself, uh, not trusting in the Lord. And uh, Sarah gave Abraham her a maid named Hagar, who was an Egyptian, and uh, Abraham had a relationship with her, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Ishmael. Uh, and, but that's when the problems started. And so Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. What's a free woman? Free woman is any woman who's not a bondwoman, right? And so Hagar was a slave, a servant of sorts, and not the kind of slave that, uh, you know, we think of in our horrible history here in the United States of America where people are just abused and taken advantage of and exploited, but a servant, an employee, that's what Hagar was, okay? And uh, Sarah was not. Uh, in that category. So we've got two categories, and Paul is setting up an analogy that he's going to uh, reveal to us. Okay, so let's keep reading now a little bit further. Verse number 23, but the son of the bondwoman, that is Hagar, was born according to the flesh. That is, you know, that uh, kid, Ishmael, was born like every other kid has ever been born by two people having a sexual relationship. And the son by the free woman through the promise, okay? So, you know, there was something supernatural involved in the birth of Isaac because he came as a direct result of God's promise to Abraham and Sarah, and they were not able to have children being, what was it, uh, you know, 199 years old or 100 or whatever it was, okay? And so we got, you know, Two children, one born of the flesh, one born from a promise. Verse 24, now Paul's going to elaborate on his allegory derived from that story. This is allegorically speaking. For these women are two covenants. So he's going to assign 
a covenant identification with both of them, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves, she is Hagar. Well, uh, so he's corresponding Hagar, the, the, the servant, the slave, and she's going to, of course, naturally bear children who are slaves, and corresponding her with Mount Sinai uh, in Arabia. Well, that's where God gave Moses and the children of Israel the Ten Commandments. Moses went up on Mount Sinai, came back down with the Ten Commandments. So that represents the law. So he's just drawing the same uh, illustration he's drawn before, um, that, you know, Getting under the law of Moses only results in a curse and a bondage because, you know, nobody can keep it. Nobody does keep it, all right? And so they become slaves to it, and it's just a bondage they can never escape. But, of course, through Jesus Christ, Paul has told us that's how we escape it. All right, we keep reading in verse number 25. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. So now Paul draws a third analogy. Not only do we have Hagar corresponding to Mount Sinai, we've got Mount Sinai corresponding to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children. Well, Jerusalem back in his day, of course, is full of Jews. For the most part, people who rejected Christ, crucified Christ, uh, hated Christ, and were endeavoring to... Uh, establish their own righteousness in their feeble attempts to keep the law of Moses, thinking that that was the way to, to get righteousness before God. And it wasn't, okay? So they're just in bondage to the law, in slavery to law. They, you know, doing their uh, best to, uh, you know, to keep it, but failing miserably. It's not getting them anything, and they're missing out on the salvation that was provided through Jesus Christ and faith in him, Okay? Verse number 26, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. So again, pushing this allegory even further now, the, the, the current Jerusalem is in bondage because they're trying to keep the law, but we who have believed in Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile, uh, don't look to the, you know, the current Jerusalem a, 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 with any sense of spiritual identification. We, however, look to a different Jerusalem, and he calls it here the, the Jerusalem above. The Jerusalem above. What's that? Well, that's interesting because it's really the first time you can find it here in Scripture. It's found in a few other places. And we're going to have to start in our next segment thinking about a couple of those places. So can't wait for that. Be right back. Alrighty, welcome back. Still here in Galatians chapter 4, working our way through an allegory that Paul is setting up to help his readers to understand that uh, they've been set free from any kind of bondage that uh, the Jews in Jerusalem are still under as they uh, do their best to establish their own righteousness by keeping the law of Moses. Certainly not the way to get to God uh, because he sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins upon the cross and salvation comes by faith and faith in him. And that produces a different kind of a righteousness, a righteousness that stems from one's heart because one believes with the heart in Jesus. And so it, it becomes more than a religion, it becomes a relationship with Jesus. And we're born of the Spirit. And as Paul has said over and over again, we become sons of God. You know, we cry out to him, Abba, Father. So we want to please him as our Father. And thank God we're not having to worry about all those ritualistic and ceremonial aspects of the law of Moses. But we do have his law written in our heart. He promised that under the new covenant. And it's the law of Christ, a law that leads us to love and to serve and to deny ourselves, okay? So this is all Christianity 101, and I'm just reminding you of it, all right? So I want to keep reading now in Galatians chapter 4 as Paul stretches out this analogy, and I have to, you know, submit to you that this is not Paul's strongest argument because it's just not watertight. He draws comparisons that, you know, you could almost say, well, what gives you the right to, to, to draw those comparisons and to make this correspond with that and that and the other? It's not something that's clear. Uh, no one would have ever seen this from the uh, Old Testament as a, a hidden lesson unless, unless Paul brought it out, okay? Uh, but there are, there are things like that. I mean, there are some obvious types and shadows in the Old Testament that aren't made, me made reference to in the New Testament. You know, you just think about, for example, Joseph and his life, how he was betrayed by his own 
throne for, for uh, you know, for so many pieces of silver as Jesus was. And, and there's so many correlations between Joseph and Jesus, but the New Testament never really talks about that. But it's obvious to anybody who reads it and knows both the stories. Okay, so anyways, enough said, verse number 25. Now this Hagar, uh, that's Abraham's, uh, I guess you'd call wife, uh, is Mount Sinai, but not really, in Arabia, corresponds to the present Jerusalem. She is in slavery with her children. The, the, everyone in Jerusalem is still trying to keep the law of Moses. They're in bondage. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is a mother. That's who we look to, you know, as our mother of sorts. Now, this is the first time that I'm aware of that the new Jerusalem is ever mentioned uh, in the scripture. I mean, it's, of course, mentioned in uh, the Old Testament, drawn out in, uh, I guess it is in Isaiah, now that it com comes to my mind, in one of the final chapters of Isaiah. But the first time in the New Testament it's mentioned that I can think of, as I'm sitting here talking to you. And uh, he calls it the, the Jerusalem that's above. Uh, in, in Hebrews, the author, he was refers to it as the heavenly Jerusalem. And then, of course, uh, revealed in its fullness in the last couple of chapters of Revelation, where John describes the new Jerusalem, and, 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 and he describes the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to earth. Wow. And so cool stuff. And when we get to Revelation, we'll talk about it, um, talk about it more. But um, again, this is just part of Paul's rather complex analogy. Now let's read verse number 27. For it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more numerous are the children of the desolate than, the, than of the one who has a husband. And within the whole context of this Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar thing, and the Isaac being born of the promise and Ishmael being born of the flesh, and therefore you know, Sarah being the barren one, it seems like a reference to the fact that there's going to be, and there is in progress, this birth of all these children, the, you know, the barren barren woman is going to bear more than the, than the, than the, than the other woman, um, than the one who has the husband. Again, doesn't line up exactly with what happened with Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. But it seems to be, the best I can tell anyways, a reference to the fact that there's going to be lots of children, spiritual children, born from Abraham and Sarah. And we know that has been a recurring theme down through these last couple of chapters, that if we're in Christ, then we become Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. You remember the promise that God gave to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations, all the Gentiles will be blessed. And this is a chapter really right out of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 54, which that's probably one that's not familiar to you, as it's not that familiar to me. But most all of us are familiar with Isaiah chapter 53, could be the most famous, well-known chapter in the Old Testament. It's all about uh, Jesus, and he would be, like the last couple, ver last verse there is that he would, uh, he would he'd be numbered with the transgressors, and he'd bear the sins of many. That's Isaiah chapter 53, the last couple verses. And so then we read this one about the barren woman rejoicing. Okay, and, and so Paul's tying it in somehow, some way, to the story of Abraham and Sarah. Um, again, it, it, it's it's not a gr great argument in my mind to prove Paul's point. It's a little bit of a stretch. It seems like it's stringing some scriptures together that maybe uh, there isn't a whole lot of warrant to apply that kind of significance. But I think Paul's just trying to create an allegory, that's all. Just to help them see one more time that if you're trying to get under the law, you're trying to get into bondage. God's release people from bondage. You know, don't go that route, my Gentile brothers in Christ. <clears throat> All right, verse number 28 of Galatians 4. You, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. Okay, so you're not like Ishmael, born of the flesh, trying to work it out yourself. You're born of the promise. God made a promise. You had faith in that promise, and that has caused your birth. But as at, but as at the time, he who was born according to the flesh, that's Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so it is now also. Well, that's another uh, just 
tying in one more thing from this analogy, you know, it was the it was the Jews who were keeping the law of Moses, who were persecuting Jews who were no longer keeping the law of Moses, but believing in Christ, and also persecuting Gentiles who had come to believe in Christ, but were not willing to come under the law of Moses. And so there was persecution for that reason. But there's going to be an outcome to all this in the end, and Paul also grabs a verse from uh, Genesis for that one. We'll have to read that next time. Be right back. Okay, welcome back to Galatians chapter 4. We're just about to the end of this uh, very uh, complex allegory that uh, Paul has strung together from the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac. And, and, and it's pretty cool. I just got to say, once again, it's just not a, a watertight argument to, to make Paul's point. But, you know, he's already made some very watertight arguments already. So this is just kind of wrapping it up. And you're going to see an element here as we segue into chapter 5 where definitely he's in the wrapping up phase now. So uh, he, he said, and we're reading this from last time, verse 29, but as at that time he who was born according to the flesh, Ishmael, persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. Well, that's part of the story there in, uh, you know, in the Genesis account where Ishmael began to mock uh, Isaac and so forth and, and Sarah, Sarah was upset about that. And so she went to Abraham and told him and she said, I don't want this woman and her, her son around here making fun of my son and I want her out. And uh, Abraham was perplexed. What do I do about this? And God said, listen to your wife. Okay. That cause us to scratch our heads a little bit. But let's keep reading here. Um, Paul's drawing the analogy that you are, um, so it's the same today. Those who are, you know, those who are of the flesh are persecuting those who are born of the spirit. That is, the Jews who are under the law, keeping the law, are persecuting you who are not under the law. Keep reading now, verse 30. But what does the scripture say? And here's a quotation from Sarah speaking to Abraham, cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. You know, you kind of wish that, that Sarah would have been a little more mature and to work this out with Hagar. I mean, for goodness sakes, why would she ever ask her husband to cast out her, her maid but his son? You know, come on. That's asking a lot. And Abraham was troubled by it. He did go to God. God said, go ahead, listen to your wife. And you know the story. God did make a great nation of Ishmael. Uh, the whole Arab uh, you know, race has basically come from Ishmael. And, and Abraham's subsequent sons, after Sarah died through his wife Keturah, he had six kids through Keturah. Okay, so verse 31, so then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman woman, and now chapter 5 starts, but there's really no chapter and verse that Paul wrote, and so it just continues the flow. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. All right, now, if you've been with me, you know what that means, and you know what that does not mean. And probably you're already thinking to yourself, I heard people quote that verse, and they've twisted it to mean what it doesn't mean because it's only referring to the law of Moses. That's the yoke of slavery. When someone says, you see, according to Galatians 5 and verse number 1, Christ set us free, keep standing firm, and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. You see, Christ set us free from the law. So we don't have to you know, worry about keeping commandments. And all the things that Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, that we don't have to worry about that. That was under the old covenant. I've even heard pastors pray this you know, in their prayer to God. Thank you, Lord, that, that lots of the red letters of the Bible, we know that's under the old covenant. And what they're saying is it's irrelevant. The yoke of slavery was, as Peter said, why do we try to subject the Gentiles to a yoke which neither we nor our forefathers have been able to bear? Speaking specifically of the law of Moses. He's not talking about the, the yoke of the law of Christ. Christ said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Okay, and uh, Jesus said, go and go and uh, make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've observed. You know, 
That's the new covenant, folks. That's what Christ wants us doing. And so all that Paul is writing about when he talks about it was for freedom that Christ set us free, Christ set us free from the demands and the obligations of the law of Moses. And that only applies to Jews anyways because it was never given to the Gentiles. But in this case, it's relevant because the Jews were trying to give it to the Gentiles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so keep standing firm, Paul says. When those, those Judaizers tell you you need to be circumcised and start keeping the law of Moses, you just tell them, no way, Jose, you know, I, I, I'm going to stand firm against you. I'm not going to put, be put under a yoke that even you are not able to bear. Okay, it's very clear. It's not the law of Christ. Now, verse number two of Galatians 5. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, see, that's the issue. He's not concerned about them, you know, living pure and holy lives. If you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Because Paul has already told them that they're all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He said that over and over again. And um, now he's telling them, if you get circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. So it sounds to me like they're going to lose what they gained. And uh, people that believe you can't lose what you gained relative to salvation really stumble over this verse and the subsequent verses after it that where Paul just builds on that subject. Uh, verse number 3 of Galatians 5, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. There you go. If you're going to get under the law of Moses, there's a covenant. Whoever does these will live. So there you go. You want to you want to earn your salvation by keeping the law? Just get start with circumcision and go on from there. Keep the whole law perfectly. But you're going to find all it brings you is a curse because you won't keep it perfectly. Nobody's kept it perfectly except for Jesus. Okay? So if you're going to get circumcised, then you got to do it all. So when these guys just are always emphasizing circumcision, circumcision, maybe some feast days, you realize they're not telling you the whole story. you got to keep it all. And even they are not keeping it all. We're going to read him saying this momentarily, okay? Verse number 4 of Galatians 5. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, if you believe, like so many believe, that you can't fall from grace, that's a tough scripture to deal with because Paul just said these folks will fall from grace if they go the route they're looking to go. All right? We're going to talk about that when we start off next time. It's going to be good. See ya. Next time. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the behind the scenes videos. Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant. And learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.